So we come to lecture five on Machen and the Presbyterian controversy and thinking this in this case about his battle against liberalism, which is pre pretty much the way people remember him uh, generally positively for fighting liberalism, but did he get caught up in a lot of other unnecessary fights? Uh, I'm trying to make the case throughout this series that there were a lot of issues at work in American society, if not more generally, that also involved the church, which is why Machen may have needed to fight more than just departures from uh, Presbyterian doctrine in the case of liberalism, but also needed to think about institutions, the relationship of Christianity to culture, uh, what was happening in Western society more generally. So, um, but the next stop on this tour of Machen's life and thought is to think about his objections to liberalism specifically, and this brings us to his most famous book, Christianity and Liberalism, published in 1923. It was not his first book. His first book was The Origin of Paul's Religion, um, which informed greatly Christianity and liberalism. And he also published a grammar for New Testament Greek that came out the previous year, 1922. Um, and typically, people, when they look at this book from the perspective of history or even during the time in which it was written, they look at it as a fundamentalist book. I've been trying to argue that Machen was not a fundamentalist, that he was a Presbyterian, and it makes more sense to understand the controversies in the Presbyterian Church through the lens of Presbyterianism and not fundamentalism. So this will be a, a test case, in a way, of trying to situate Machen's explicit objections to liberalism in this book uh, and how they compare to fundamentalism. Um, Machen was an unlikely fundamentalist, even if he was one. He didn't come from that side of the tracks. He was much more a part of the, of the Protestant establishment, parent, parental, family associations, his education, all the sorts of people that he knew lent him uh, uh, or, or made him encouraged him much more to identify with elites in American society, not with, say, the so-called rabble of fundamentalism. And this may explain why one of the uh, statements he made in 1927, he said, I never call myself a fundamentalist. There is indeed no inherent objection to the term. And if the disjunction is between fundamentalism and modernism, then I am willing to call myself a fundamentalist of the most pronounced type. But after all, what I prefer to call myself is not a fundamentalist, but a Calvinist. That is, an adherence of the Reformed faith. Machen wrote that, actually, strikingly, in a, um, <clears throat> in, a, in a letter to the newly formed board of Bryan Memorial University, a, a, a university named for William Jennings Bryan, who had died two years before, after his um, work at the Scopes trial, um, Machen was obviously a leading conservative, someone who would have been attractive to the board there, um, but Machen did not want to leave Presbyterian vineyards to work in something that was not distinctly Presbyterian. So um, th that's where that statement comes from. Now, looking at the book particularly, and this relates directly to the previous lecture about 1920 being such an important part of um, the Presbyterian controversy and Machen's contention, uh, his fighting in the church and beyond. Um, the Christian liberalism, uh, the preface to the book says this, on, number, on November 3rd, 1921, the author of the present book delivered before the Ruling Elders Association of Chester Presbytery, an address which was subsequently published in the Princeton Theological Review under the title Liberalism or Christianity. The editors read it, they asked him to expand it, so Machen uh, worked that lecture and, and article into this book. But it's striking that he made connections with these elders from the Chester Presbytery, which is the presbytery just south and west of Philadelphia. 
he made connections with this group back at the General Assembly of 1920. Um, and, and so Machen's beginning to think about liberalism in connection with what he saw at the General Assembly of 1920 and the effort for church union there. <clears throat> um, in the first year, the book did not make any real uh, significant um, dent in the arguments about the church or uh, religion in America. It sold roughly 1,000 copies in, in 1923. And then in 1924, it, it increased fourfold. It sold 4,000 copies, which may not sound like a lot, but that's pretty good for a book, actually. Um, there were many factors for this, but one of those was Machen was preaching as stated supply at First Presbyterian Church in Princeton from July to December of 1923. At uh, the end of that time, <clears throat> he preached a sermon the last day of 1923 that I, we will talk about in the next lecture that turned out to be quite controversial. And one of the members of the church, Henry Van Dyke, who was a professor of literature at Princeton Seminary, a friend of the family, Machen referred to Van Dyke in correspondence with his brother as Uncle Henry. Um, <clears throat> and he was a pew holder there at the church he held a press conference to say that he was resigning his membership at the church, a press conference, no less. He also had been an ambassador to the Netherlands during the Wilson administration. Um, so he, he decides he'll resign, he'll decide to make it public, that he couldn't take any more of the kind of preaching that Machen was uh, giving, even though that was the last time that Machen was going to preach during this time of stated supply. So at that point, Machen becomes a figure in the news, a figure in the headlines, and uh, begins to gain uh, notoriety as a controversial figure. So that's part of the reason why the book began to sell well. And then the following, well, 1925, just to give an example of Machen's prominence, um, by that point, William Jennings Bryan does invite Machen to testify at the Scopes trial. Brian would have known Machen even before any of his celebrity because they were in the same communion, the Presbyterian Church. Um, Machen declined that invitation, um, saying he was not an Old Testament scholar. I think he had other reasons why he didn't want to go to testify there as well, thinking it might be something of a circus. But <clears throat> when the New York Times asked Machen during the trial to write an article, what fundamentalism stands for, which was going to be paired with an article, What Evolution Stands For Now, Machen did write that article. Um, so again, that's one indication of Machen's rising prominence as a public figure. Now, looking at the book, one thing to notice is that it is not a fundamentalist book. Again, the reasons for that have to do with its origins in Presbyterian controversies. But it also has to do with the nature of fundamentalism itself. What was fundamentalism? <clears throat> the word fundamental had already been used by a publication of tracts called The Fundamentals beginning in 1915. And then there was an association formed in 1919 headed by William Bell Riley, a prominent Northern Baptist in Minnesota, called the World Christian Fundamentals Association. They were going to defend the faith. And then Baptists, there was a controversy among Baptists during this time, and some of the editors of Baptist new, newspapers began to actually use the term fundamentalist to apply to them. So the origins of the word do not come from Presbyterian sources, if that makes any difference. It's also important to see that what drove fundamentalists oftentimes were two particular uh, doctrines having to do with the origins of uh, human history and the end of human history. So on the one hand, they were very much opposed to evolution. Um, William Jennings Bryan was a prominent figure in some of these fundamentalist circles, speaking at various conferences, writing against uh, evolution, and then ev eventually being the chief prosecutor at the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. 
Uh, so that's one aspect of this. Uh, then the other aspect had to do with the nature of the end of history or when Christ returns, and fundamentalists were typically known for being dispensationalists. <clears throat> uh, dispensationalism was a version of premillennialism, divides uh, redemptive history up into seven eras or dispensations. In each case, there's a period of uh, God's enter in, entering into an agreement with his people, setting up the terms of a relationship. The people fail, judgment comes. It's a cycle of uh, failure and judgment, and the church age in which dispensationalists placed the church <clears throat> um, was also going to be a time when uh, apostasy would eventually lead to judge the final judgment and Christ's return. It's a very simple way of, of putting it. But that's those were two doctrines that were very important to, to fundamentalists, defending creation, although this wasn't scientific creation, that, be, that became more prominent after World War II among conservative Protestants, but still defending creation as well as a um, particular view of Christ's return uh, at, at the end of time. Machen himself um, didn't write much about creation, doesn't mention creation in the book, and when he does refer to dispensationalism or some of the views that are circu circulating uh, with regard to Christ's return, he says uh, this on page 49, at least of the, um, the edition that I have. He's talking about um, differences among conservative Protestants, and one of the differences has to do with when Christ will return. He says, um, the recrudescence of chiliasm, or chiliasm, or premillennialism in the modern church causes us serious concern. It is coupled, we think, with a false method of interpreting Scripture, which in the long run will be productive of harm. So he doesn't say the word dispensationalism. Machen actually doesn't come to know much about it until the 1930s, when it's becoming, prom uh, becoming known that it's part of, of the conservative Presbyterian movement of which he's a part. I'll say that more about that in a lecture ahead. But he, he, he is concerned about it here, even in, in Christian liberalism. So he's not identifying with these two features of fundamentalism. One other area where people try to find connections between Machen and fundamentalism, or even old Princeton and fundamentalism, is with the doctrine of inerrancy. And Princeton Seminary, people like A.A. Uh, A. Hodge and B.B. Warfield were quite extensive in defending the infallibility and authority of Scripture, wrote extensively about it, some prominent articles. Um, and, and you might think that this would be a case that Machen would recognize in fundamentalism a defense of the inerrancy of Scripture, which would lead him to side with fundamentalism. But he writes about the Bible, which is, I think, the shortest chapter of the book. He writes about inerrancy in basically two pages. It's not really what's driving Machen in the book. So that's another reason for... for seeing some distance between Machen and fundamentalism. And conversely, what is the longest chapter of the book is the, is the chapter on salvation. Um, and it's the chapter where Machen defends the vicarious atonement. So Machen really was concerned in Christianity and liberalism with the doctrines of grace, with sin and salvation and Christ's work on the cross, his resurrection, ascension, uh, Paul's articulation of that. So his work on Paul was important for Machen understanding the significance of Christ's work in salvation. And that's why um, I would argue Machen's book is not a fundamentalist book, even though that's typically the, the, um, the box in which people will pack it, as it were. But there are reasons for thinking about Christian liberalism, on the other hand, as a fundamentalist book. And one of the reasons for that is that the book is anti-liberal. If fundamentalism is def defined by being opposed to liberalism or modernism, I'm using the two somewhat interchangeably here, then Machen is clearly a fundamentalist because he's anti-modernist or anti-liberal. <clears throat> but the way he understands liberalism still may be worth considering, and it, I think it does separate him from the uh, 
other fundamentalists who are opposed to liberalism. Machen knew liberalism firsthand, at least the German varieties studying in Germany when he did. Uh, he, old Princeton, faculty of Princeton were steeped in uh, reading liberal theology, steeped in polemics against liberal theology, uh, defending the Reformed faith in, in a variety of ways, very thoughtful ways. So this was not something that was unknown to Machen. People have tried to say that Christianity and liberalism is written against European theological developments, not against American ones. And I, I think that's wrong because Machen was very much writing with 1920, the plan of union, social gospel, ecumenism in mind. That was the nature of American liberalism. Um, but he does tr try to diagnose it, and he does so, I think, in a very important way. And, and, and the first part to notice is the naturalistic character of Christianity, of liberalism, excuse me. And it has to do with how to think about how to defend Christianity in the, na in the modern world. And what's striking about the way Machen opens the book is that he does give liberals credit for actually trying to do apologetics, trying to save Christianity in the modern world. <clears throat> um, he says, at the root of it is a naturalism, which denies the creative power of God to intervene in the world. And the reason for that has to do with intellectual developments in the West, about which he writes this. The past 100 years have witnessed the beginning of a new era in human history which may conceivably be regretted, but certainly cannot be ignored by the most obstinate conservatism. The change is not something that lies beneath the surface and might be visible only to the discerning eye. On the contrary, it forces itself upon the attention of the plain man at a hundred points. Modern inventions and the industrialism that has been built upon them have given us many, in many respects a new world to live in. We can no more remove ourselves from that world than we can escape from the atmosphere that we breathe. <clears throat> so science, industry, technology have changed this world. <clears throat> uh, then he goes on to say that Christ liberals, in the face of these changes in the modern world, are trying to do something uh, to save Christianity from the objections of people who are scientific. He writes... Later in the introduction, what is the relation between Christianity and, and modern culture? May Christianity be maintained in a scientific age? Another variation on his theme of how does Christianity relate to culture? He goes on to, to write, it is this problem which modern liberalism attempts to solve. Admitting that scientific, scientific objections may arise against the particularities of the Christian religion, against the doctrines of the person of Christ and of redemption through his death and resurrection. The liberal theologian seeks to rescue certain of the general principles of religion of which these particularities are thought to be mere temporary symbols and these general principles he regards as constituting the essence of Christianity. So notice here the general teachings of Christianity in contrast with the particularities of Christianity Machen's concerned particularly with the particulars of the person of Christ and redemption through his death and resurrection. And those things don't square with modern science. So is there a way of salvaging Christianity, other general truths, like the truths from the preamble to the plan of organic union, that would be a way of maintaining Christian faith in the modern world? Machen sees this as what is driving liberalism. But it is... I think important to see that Machen recognizes, recognizes liberalism as an effort to defend Christianity. And in that sense, it is a kind of apologetic. <clears throat> but there are also other objections to Christianity. Among them is that in trying to save Christianity, trying to save the general truths, liberals wind up making Christianity something little more than moralism. Um, so in his, in his chapter on Christ, the fifth chapter of the book, uh, Machen draws on his work on Paul to try to understand 
Well, how did Paul understand Christ? How did Paul understand the work of Christ? Was Christ an example to be followed, a kind of moral example? He had this great teaching of morality, or was there something more about Christ? <clears throat> so he writes this, an appeal to the example of Jesus is not indeed absent from the Pauline epistles, and certainly was not absent from Paul's life. The example of Jesus was found by Paul, moreover, not merely in the acts of incarnation and atonement, but even in the daily life of Jesus in Palestine. Exaggeration with regard to this matter should be avoided. Plainly, Paul knew far more about the life of Jesus than in the epistles he has seen fit to tell. Plainly, the epistles do not begin to contain all the instruction which Paul had given to the churches at the commencement of their Christian life. <clears throat> but even after exaggerations have been avoided, the fact is significant enough. The plain fact is that the imitation of Jesus, important though it was for Paul, was swallowed up by something far more important still. Not the example of Jesus, but the redeeming work of Jesus was the pr primary thing for Paul. The religion of Paul was not primarily faith in God like Jesus' faith. It was faith in Jesus. In this stunning statement, Paul committed to Jesus without reserve the eternal destinies of his soul. So he didn't commit to himself the eternal destinies of himself, uh, of his soul, his, his ability to follow Jesus' example. He committed to Jesus by faith in Jesus and what he had done, the eternal destiny of his soul. So that's one way in which Machen does ob object to the moralism of liberalism, to reduce, to try to hold on to Christianity and to hold on to it by going to its morality <clears throat> or the teachings of Jesus. Um, but he also objected to the way that liberalism disregarded doctrine and tended to make Christianity a feeling, an experience. And this has some, perhaps, resonance with evangelicals who sometimes off, uh, emphasize conversion experience some at the expense of doctrine, you could say. But still, we don't need to get into that. He does worry, though, about what um, <clears throat> this... Uh, inattention, neglect of doctrine, does to Christianity. And he writes this in his chapter on doctrine, which is a long chapter as well, and he defends doctrine as of the essence of Christianity. Uh, the, he, he writes this, The great weapon with which the disciples set out to conquer the world was not a mere comprehension of eternal principles. It was an historical message, an account of something that had recently happened. It was the message, he is risen. <clears throat> he goes on there writing, The coming of Jesus was understood now as an act of God by which sinful men were saved. The primitive church was concerned not merely with what Jesus had said, but also and primarily with what Jesus had done. The world was to be redeemed through the proclamation of an event. And with the event went the meaning of the event. And the setting forth of the event with the meaning of the event was doctrine. These two elements are always combined in the Christian message. The narration of the facts is history. The narration of facts with the meaning of the facts is doctrine. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. That is history. He loved me and gave himself for me. That is doctrine. Such was the Christianity of the modern church. So Machen is intent to preserve doctrine, doctrine as the interpretation of the redemptive works of God, the redemptive work of Christ. <clears throat> Machen also is opposed, as we've seen in some ways already, with his suspicions about the plan of union and the, the, the relationship between the social gospel and ecumenism. But he's very much concerned with a utilitarian view of Christianity, which uses Christianity to improve society, which is another, word of, another, another way of saying he's concerned about the social gospel aspects of liberal Protestantism. <clears throat> In his uh, chapter on salvation, 
he writes this. Religion, <clears throat> I'm sorry, before this he says, the liberal preacher has very little to say about the other world, the world to come. This world is really the center of all his thoughts. Religion itself and even God are made merely a means for the betterment of conditions upon this earth. Again, a utilitarian understanding of Christianity. Thus religion, he goes on to write, has become a function of the community or of the state. So it is looked upon by the men of the present day. Even hard-headed businessmen and politicians have become convinced that religion is needed. But it is thought to be needed merely as a means to an end. <clears throat> we have tried to get along without religion, it is said, but the experiment was a failure, and now religion must be called in for help. For example, there is the problem of the immigrants. Great populations have found a place in our country. <clears throat> they do not speak our language or know our customs. And we do not know what to do with them. We have attacked them by oppressive legislation or proposals of legislation, but such measures have not been altogether effective. Somehow these people display a perverse attachment to the language that they learned at their mother's knee. It may be strange that a man should love the language that he learned at his mother's knee, but these people do love it, and we are perplexed in our efforts to produce a unified American people. So religion is called in to help. We are inclined to proceed against the immigrants now with a Bible in one hand and a club in the, in the other, offering them the blessings of liberty. That is what is sometimes meant by Christian Americanization. <clears throat> Some really nice shots here at progressivism, um, and Machen was very much opposed to standard as laws against teaching foreign languages in public schools, partly because he wanted Latin and Greek to be taught in schools, but also he wanted to preserve ethnic groups, Spanish, Germans, Dutch, who were, who were holding on to their languages as well. Um, <clears throat> so Machen was concerned about the social as using Christianity for its social aspects. He was also concerned about intellectual dishonesty among liberals. And that, you know, that's, that, those are loaded terms, but you do, it does come up when he starts talking about the nature of the churches as creedal institutions and the way that creeds functions, creeds function in the church. So he, he writes here, this is his chapter, the last chapter on the church. <clears throat> um, he, he's talking about the effort to sink doctrinal differences and unite the church on a program of Christ, Christian service. He says it is unsatisfactory, this plan, because it is, so, sorry, in its usual contemporary form, it is dishonest. Whatever may be thought of Christian doctrine, it can hardly be denied that honesty is one of the weightier matters of the law. Yet honesty is being relinquished in wholesale fashion by the liberal party in many ecclesiastical bodies today. To recognize the fact that fact, one does not need to take sides at all with the standard, sorry, with regard to the doctrinal or historical questions. Suppose it to be true that devotion to a creed is a sign of narrowness or intolerance. Suppose the church ought to be founded upon devotion to the ideal of Jesus or upon the desire to put his spirit into operation in the world, and not at all upon a confession of faith with regard to his redeeming work. Even if all this were true, even if a creedal church were an undesirable thing, it would still remain true that as a matter of fact, many evangelical churches are creedal churches and that if a man does not accept their creed, he has no right to a place in their teaching ministry. The creedal character of the churches is differently expressed in the different evangelical bodies, but the example of the Presbyterian church may perhaps serve to illustrate what is meant. It is required of all officers in the Presbyterian Church, including ministers, that at their ordination, they make answer plainly to a series of questions which begin with the two following. Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? And do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession 
of faith of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures. If these constitutional questions do not fix clearly the creedal basis of the Presbyterian Church, it is difficult to see how any human language could possibly do so. <clears throat> Yet immediately after making such a solemn declaration, <clears throat> excuse me, immediately after declaring that the Westminster Confession contains the system of doctrine taught in infallible scriptures, many ministers of the Presbyterian Church will proceed to decry that same confession and that doctrine of the infallibility of scripture to which they have just solemnly subscribed. So this is an example of intellectual dishonesty, especially for liberals in creedal or confessional churches. And that's another little window into the argument for why it's important to read Pres Christianity and liberalism as a, a work of Presbyterian polemic, even though it's not only written for Presbyterians, but Machen is very much writing with the Presbyterian controversy in mind. So these are reasons for thinking about the book as a fundamentalist book in the sense that it's anti-liberal, but as a Presbyterian book in the sense that it's responding to liberalism in a very Presbyterian way. And um, I'll just conclude then with Machen's own conclusion to the book, which is really one of the most moving parts of the book, it seems to me, um, and uh, captures many of Machen's abilities as a writer, as someone who could, who could think clearly, argue well. Um, but he, this is how he ends the book after thinking about ways in which this controversy can be resolved. One of the ways in which it could be resolved, he argues, is there could be a separation of the two parties. And the, the one party that is still confessional and creedal would stay in the church, and per perhaps the liberals could leave. But again, remember, this is an era of union. How can you f have fought a war, civil war, et cetera? It's all these other plans of union. How could you ever split the church? Union is very much in the air. So whatever the solution, he says, one thing is clear. There must be somewhere groups of redeemed men and women who can gather together humbly in the name of Christ to give thanks for his unspeakable gift and to worship the Father through him. Such groups alone can satisfy the needs of the soul. At the present time, there is one longing of the human heart, which is often forgotten. <clears throat> it is a deep, pathetic longing of the Christian for fellowship with his brethren. One hears much, it is true, about Christian union and harmony and cooperation. Hmm, I wonder where we've heard that. But the union that is meant is often a union with the world against the Lord, or at best a forced union of machinery and tyrannical committees. How different is the true unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Sometimes it is true the longing for Christian fellowship is satisfied. There are congregations, even in the present age of conflict, that are really gathered around the table of the crucified Lord. There are pastors that are pastors, indeed. But such congregations in many cities are difficult to find. Weary with the conflicts of the world, one goes into church to seek refreshment for the soul. And what does one find? Alas, too often one finds only the turmoil of the world. The preacher comes forward not out of a secret place of meditation and power, not with the authority of God's word permeating his message, <clears throat> not with human wisdom pushed far into the background by the glory of the cross, but with human opinions about the social problems of the hour or easy solutions of the vast problem of sin. Such is the sermon. And then perhaps the service is closed by one of those hymns breathing out the angry passions of 1861, such as the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which are to be found in the back part of the hymnals. Thus the warfare of the world has entered even into the house of God, and sad indeed is the heart of man who has come seeking peace. Is there no refuse from strife? Is there no place of refreshing where a man can prepare for the battle of life? And he goes on to say that the place where you find that refreshment and surcease is in, in the church. And that's how Machen concludes the book. And that is where I will also conclude this, this lecture.